I'm just... Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Lively and Grit Daily House. Um, I, I just want to say that last pal panel uh, was really, really good. So uh, watch it on kind of live stream in the VOD. But, um, but it's so exciting because us, Lively is a creative innovation agency, and we have always believed in this sweet spot between physical and digital. And just from a personal point of view, you know, it takes me back to when I was doing music festivals back showing my age in like 2004 and making kind of TV shows out of it and websites out of the content around that live thing to then see those journeys evolve into things like actual live streaming to how people just wanting to connect more in the use of social media and now just to see thanks to the innovation with companies like Dell and NVIDIA uh, that all of this stuff is so connected. And um, yeah, whoever came up with the word fidgetal probably came up with the word experiential, but I'll go with it. But it is just so kind of exciting to see that these worlds are gonna start to come together. So uh, that takes us very nicely into our next conversation. Uh, Lucas from Arc Runner, uh, let's give him a round of applause. Hello everybody. Do you want me to talk for a bit or are we just going to chat? No, I don't want you to say anything. Fair I just enough. want you to sit there. That's, um, what, that's, no, what so people, that's what most people want. I do want, of course. I, so um, this, somebody's going to have to stop this talk because I'm really excited about this one because Lucas and I caught up and uh, we got introduced uh, on a call that I thought was going to be like a two-minute introduction by um, Cynthia from Dell. But the minute this guy started talking, I totally geeked out, got very, very excited. And so... Lucas, tell us about yourself and a little bit about the background, and then we'll get into the really good stuff. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Lucas Wilson. I'm uh, I am um, the principal lead with the Royal Ballet Opera in the UK. No, I'm just kidding. I am uh, I am uh, I'm the founder of a company called Supersphere uh, that has been around for about eight years. I say that we do all the R's: A R, M R, V R, X R, whatever R anybody else comes up with. And really, my passion since I've been a little kid has been the intersection of technology and creativity. When I was in school, when I was in junior high and high school, my two biggest loves were computers and music. So the, the crowd never knew what to do with me. The jocks never knew whether to hang out with me because I was in the band or beat up on me because I was head of the computer lab. Um, so the, and, and that's sort of the career, that's the path my career has followed. I went to music school and I've been at various times in my life a professional musician, an audio engineer, a video editor, a compositor. Uh, I worked in for about 12 years in biz dev and sales roles and software companies, culminating with, I was worked with um, James Cameron for about two years as his VP of sales in his 3D technology company. And that was the best and the worst job I've ever had. Um, don't piss Jim off, just mental note. Um, and the about eight years ago, right before, actually longer than that, I had to look it up um, a, couple of day, a couple of weeks ago. And the first VR project I produced was just over 10 years ago. Shortly before the Facebook acquisition of Oculus, I saw my first Oculus experience, and it was it was a Frankenstein beast, and it looked like crap, and it felt like crap. It was awful, but I put it on, and the very f I'm a child of the '80s. The very first thing I saw when I put it on was Dave Mustaine, lead singer of Megadeth, playing guitar in his backyard, and I was like, and I looked around, and I was in his backyard. I was like, this is awesome. And, and it, it just hit me at a very visceral level of, of how communicative the medium was. And I decided that that's what I wanted to do. So I started producing VR projects when nobody knew what that meant. I just raised my hand and said, I'm a VR producer. And people was like, okay, come do this. So I started doing projects, um, got more of them, had to hire people, had to build a company. And Supersphere has been at the, for the past eight years or so, we've done Primarily live, multi-camera, multi-geometry live streaming. I'm a marketing professional, you can tell. And what that means is that we can take HD, 4K, 8K, 180, 360, mono, stereo, mix it all together, do a multi-cam live shoot, and distribute it out to VR and non-VR locations. We've done about... 250-odd shows, everybody from Paul McCartney, Billie Eilish, Post Malone, Kanye, Offset, Young Thug, down to places you've never heard of and people you've never heard of. Right bef before the pandemic, we actually did a takeover of Mohawk, and we broadcast in VR 100 bands in four days, um, and which was, which was a, a lot of fun. 
And we have a tool called Arc Runner. I'll stop talking in a minute, I promise. We have a tool. Give it a little away. We have a tool called Arc Runner that about three years ago or so, our artists that we were working with um, are, were asking us to put them into fantastical environments. We've worked with Steve Aoki a couple of times, and he was saying, I want to perform in space and throw pies out into the audience. We were like, okay. And what they were asking to do was virtual production. They just didn't have the language for it. And we looked around to see if there were, we didn't, virtual production, if anybody knows virtual production, you probably know that it's very easy to do bad virtual production. Um, and it's, it's difficult to do good virtual production. It's expensive, it's high end, it takes a long time, and it's very, very specialized. And we looked around for tools that were not so high end, and we couldn't find any, so we wrote our own. And Arc Runner is a spatial performance platform, or the garage band virtual production, as I call it, which allows people to put themselves into spatial environments, set up stage, lights, virtual cameras, and go. From the time I... My goal for Arc Runner was always that anybody launching it, from the time they launch it to the time they could be broadcasting in VR with a good-looking show, was five minutes or less. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. I can do it in five minutes or less, um, but I'm almost there. So there you go. That's what I do. Thank you very much. And that's the end, if there's any questions. No, so um, basically, uh, look, let's pull it back a sec, because what I'm really interested in, because although you've done far more things than I have, but there's there's some similarities in, in our journey. And I was lucky enough to do one of the first UK launches of Oculus with Virgin Media at EGA uh, gaming event and stuff like that. And I think for me, I've always said I've had an identity crisis because I, I come from the live arena. You know, I used to do you know, tons of stuff in music festivals for brands and concerts and stuff like that. And the we've now called ourselves a creative innovation agency and actually the one of the strategists from adobe yesterday who's on our talk asked me you know what 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 was the difference between creativity and innovation and what roles did they play and i was kind of like well i think they're one in the same thing now because the thing that got excited and it sounds like you got excited is when you're in this world particularly in live because live if it's on the marketing side of thing, can be quite a difficult thing to measure. But the it's all about connectivity. You go to a gig to meet people, to watch a band, and all of those sort of things. And so how, from your point of view and the journey you've been on and now getting to kind of Art Runner, what role, because it's interesting, you said you're not a marketeer, you know, you, you talk about your product and your stuff like that. But what, where is this intersection between creativity and innovation? And how can creatives leverage technology like yours to kind of evolve that's it's an interesting question i've i've always thought that any kind of creativity is is i guess it depends on how you define things i've always thought that creativity is innovation at its heart you're always creating something new and reaching out to an audience my i i believe that that immersion matters that the that when you are regardless of what art you are involved with and what creative discipline you're involved with, the more that you can involve an audience in what you're doing, the better. At its very core, any kind of creative endeavor is meant to elicit an emotional response of some kind. And you are, you are always in a feedback loop between presenter, performer, and the audience in terms of doing things, getting a response, doing things, getting a response, and, and altering your presentation or performance because of that. And the more you know about technology, the more you know about the things available to you, the more you can be inspired in that moment to be able to say, hey, you know what, we didn't do this for this show, but maybe for the next show we can leverage in, you know, I'll, I'll just say it, blockchain and NFTs. No, that's the only time I'm gonna mention it, I promise. Um, you, can, you can leverage in all sorts of different technologies um, to, to do something for the next time. I mean, I mentioned, you know, I mention a, a blockchain and NFT sort of jokingly, but there is there's a platform that we've worked with called Illuvio that um, that is a blockchain streaming platform that is that does an incre it sounds like sort of who knows what do you, what is that right? But what it is is a very to me doing a show. It's a very high quality streaming platform that allows you to drop in creative elements arbitrarily during the show and reach out to an audience in that way. Anything, 
that can that can reach out to an audience in that way is is important to to elicit that emotion and to and to pull the connection between performer and audience closer together. So you know, but if I weren't hanging out in geek spaces and and learning as much as I can, then it wouldn't have occurred to me to say, oh, you know what, that would be cool for this concert that we're doing here. Especially in the VR and XR world, there's so much innovation. There's there's I always say, well, I don't know any. When somebody asks me, is anybody doing this? I say, well, I don't know anybody that's doing Doing that, but that that does not mean that there's not somebody that's going to announce tomorrow somebody that's that's doing this. It's impossible to know everything that's going on right now. It's an incredibly exciting time, I think, to be in the creative space because just because it is so hard to keep up. Because every day you wake up and if you're paying attention, you see something and you're like, well, that's cool. And, and then you think, how can I include that? So the, the line between creativity and innovation is, is blurry and I'd say almost non-existent these days. 100%. And to be honest, that, that's, uh, that's kind of ties in with what, what, well, the whole point we're doing this event and, and why actually, you know, a lot of people, because we started doing events like this, but just through a podcast and it was about creativity and innovation. And uh, people started asking us because we, in theory, are a live event company. And so people were like, why if, and you know, that label of experiential, and they were like, well, why are you talking so much about tech? And our whole thing and the whole purpose of kind of our, our rebrand six years ago was this sweet spot between physical and digital. And to your point, what we're trying to do, and thanks to Dell for this incredible morning, because hearing the last panel hearing from you it hopefully will motivate creatives to know that these things are possible and i think one of the things we've learned is trying to tell you know creatives and agencies to kind of like think about the ideas but then connect with the the people that actually know how to do it and let them work it out don't you worry about the tech just worry about the idea and then kind of bring it into this sort of a mix the thing that um you and i talked a lot about was there's you know the minute you go from a physical event into something digital the the cynics or the lovers of live suddenly are kind of start they start to be negative you know you can't recreate the feeling of a let's just focus on gigs because that's you yeah, know where we're both from that feeling of a gig you can never recreate that You've got some interesting points of view on that and some personal experiences, haven't you? Sure. So there's always naysayers that are like, well, why do you want to do VR? And you're either, either people in the music world are like, you're going to take my audience from me or uh, nobody is going to want to watch that. Um, both of those are false. I mean, I, am, I'm, I happen to be wearing a, a T-shirt today of I went and saw a performance at the Gorge um, last autumn of Brandi Carlisle doing her thing, and Joni Mitchell performed. It was the first time she had performed live in 20 years, um, had performed in that kind of a setting in 20 years. It was her first scheduled live gig in 20 years. And if you've never been to the Gorge, it's this open-air amphitheater in, in south e southeast Washington State, it's electric. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And just by virtue of the fact that it takes a long time to get there, if you're there, you're a super fan because it's not something you do casually. And I will tell you that there is no experience that I can create, no matter how much tech I have, there's no experience that I can create that will match the atmosphere in that audience when Joni Mitchell walked on stage and she sat down and started singing California. And it was just, it was just every, there was tens of thousands of people and you could have heard a pin drop. It was, and that's, everybody has had, I think, the feeling of being at a gig and being at a concert <clears throat> and the lights go down and there's that feeling of electricity when the artist is about to come on. I, I do not believe that can be replicated in any kind of virtual environment. But, but what matters is that if you think about, just, just put in your, put in your head for a minute, a movie or or a piece of music that you love. Um, think about a movie that you love. Now think about looking at that movie on your iPhone. Now think about looking at it on a big screen in your living room. Now think about going to your friend's house. Everybody has a friend that spends too much on their AV system. Um, go to that friend's house and they have the surround and they have the big monitor. Think about seeing it there. Now in a movie theater. Now in IMAX. Same piece of content, very, very different emotional responses that it's going to give you. And I believe that that extends to headsets and to immersion. 
I don't like headsets. I don't wear headsets very often because I think they're uncomfortable. And I think that I think that most people think they're uncomfortable. But you have to see beyond that. You have to see that they are they are a temporary technology manifestation of of something that matters, of an immersive presentation that matters. And when you are in a headset, when you are in an immersive space, what matters is that <clears throat> excuse excuse me. It's the same thing as at a live gig. You're not focused on anything else. You're focused on that presentation, and you're focused on what's being sent to you. You're not focused on the, scr on the screen in front of you, and, oh, here's a phone, and here's something else, and here's something else. You're focused on that. And, w and again, everything that I do is, comes back to, does, this, does what I'm doing help foster the connection between a performer and the audience? Does it make that connection, connection closer? If it doesn't, then to me it can be discarded. I think, I, think, I think everybody here, thank you so much, I think everybody here is familiar with, especially in our, in our field, there's an awful lot of, of technology masturbation. There's an awful lot of technology for technology's sake that you see, that you see somebody make something and you're like, that's cool and I cannot think of a single use case for that, right? And that is uninteresting to me. It is, it is, I always have the mission in my head of, does this foster the connection? Does this foster the emotional connection between a performer and audience? If it does, then it's valid and it needs to be followed. Um, we're doing a thing with, um, uh, we, we've done a partnership with, um, with AMD in which we are using their systems. They have, a, they have this technology called CVML, again, marketeers, um, CVML that does depth, real-time depth segmentation, right? What that means is that I can throw away my green screen. I can, put, I can put a camera on a performer and be able to remove them from the background and put them into a virtual environment that we're building and be able to do that live and in real time. That is a valid technology. Even though it's at its beginning stages right now, I'm very into that and pursuing that because if I can get rid of green screen, then, then, then fantastic. I can, I can, people can perform and be at home in their own element without having all this crap around them. So that matters. So I, I have no idea where I started that with that and where I'm well, ending. Well, I'm going to help you on that. Don't okay, worry. Great. Don't worry. So the one, the, the other bit that you discussed though, which, cause I got a confession to make. We run an agency that is this sweet spot between physical and digital and my business partner does the live streaming and I've always believed in kind of broadcast and stuff like that. The one thing I had my doubts about was like you said, the headsets, especially when you know there was a particular big business that launched out of the UK that was gonna you know signed up all these VR deals. And for me, when I experienced it, it almost gamified the experience too much. And the key thing when you go to an event, any event, whether it's a concert or something like this, is, yeah, great, of course, the people on the stage are important. And it's hopefully good content. But it's that connection that you have just before and just afterwards and that conversation. You make friends. You learn even more. And... I did. I never thought you would get that. I always was like, "Well, we're just going to be isolating ourselves with this go these goggles." But you changed my mind because you had a. Oh, it sounds a bit weird, but you had an emotional experience with goggles. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, um, that just came out really badly. Uh, can you tell us about that, please? My emotional experience with goggles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anybody <laughs> underage here? No, okay. Um, so the, uh, you know, there, there's, um, there's, there's a couple of different stories that I that stick in my that stick in my head. Um, about about the power of immersive media and about the power of, of connection. And one of them is that one thing that I think it's important to remember is that nobody in here is under 18. Um, and I see a lot of gray hair and I see a, I see a lot of people that, that, um, that don't recover so quickly from hangovers. Um, and, and I am one of those people, right? A lot of the stuff we're creating is not for us. Right? It's, for, it's for the people that are going to have buying power in four or five years and how they are going to connect. So this, that was brought home to me in that we've done a couple of shows with Billie Eilish. Um, and she's 
lovely and Phineas, they're lovely people. Um, but we did this one show and a buddy of mine that runs a visual effects company in LA, uh, his daughter at the time, she was, I think 11 was like a huge, huge Billie Eilish fan. So, you know, I got, I got him sort of the secret decoder ring so that she could be in a headset and see us do sound check and see us do all the stuff that we do to prep with an artist before the show. So she could do that. And so she did sound check and she thought that was really cool. And then she saw, she saw the concert that we did with Billie Eilish and she loved it. My buddy sent me some pictures and it was all very nice. And then he called me uh, like a couple of days later. He was like, dude, I got to tell you this. And I was like, okay. He was like, my daughter was the cool kid at her school the next day because she had seen the show the previous night. She was the one that went to the concert and had seen the concert and was cool because of it. And it was a VR concert. And I was like, really? And, and he was like, yeah, man. She came home and she was like, oh, that was awesome that I went to see the Billie Eilish show. Everybody was, she was the cool kid, right? She went to the show. And to this day, she still calls the Billie Eilish concert the first concert she attended. So, so that had a huge impact on me of, I mean, the first concert I attended was Kiss. And, and, and I was very young. And what was all that weird smelling stuff in the air around me, right? And the, her first concert she saw was in a headset, and it was Billie Eilish. And it made the emotional impact to her that to this day, she's, I think, 17 or 18 now, to this day, she still calls that the first show that she saw. So that, to me, was like, okay, I'm, I think this is cool, and I'm doing it because I think it's cool, but we're designing for them, not, not us. And we are designing for a generation that is going to share in volumes, in 3D spaces. All this stuff that's cutting edge right now, and we're all talking about volumetric scanning and, and volume performances, and, and that's going to be second nature to, to the next generation of media consumers and creative consumers. Can, can I just keep talking, or do you want me to stop? <laughs> Well, the bit I, I, uh, cause <laughs> th no, this is great. There's, th there's three tiers to this question. Cause the other bit, um, was the fact that you, cause talking about an, uh, my paranoia of people having an insular experience of just putting a goggle on and watching it, you had, a, you went to a virtual gig and you said you actually like, oh, right, 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 yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's all right. I knew I was missing something. The um, so it shows I remember our conversations. I, amazing. Uh, the um, so we've done a lot of work with with Meta, um, and we've done a lot of of live streaming VR live streaming work with Meta, and when I first saw the beta of what was called Venues, which was Meta's VR live streaming um, experience, when I first saw the beta of Venues many years ago, I thought this is what in the 8-bit hellhole is this, right? And I thought, and I thought, okay, this is silly and it's not going to work, but hey, it's meta and they're paying us money to do cool live shows, so I'm on board, 100%, right? Love a PO. Um, but then something happened, is that, is that I went into the headset and, and all the 8-bit avatars that were around, in, if you've ever been in venues, you know, it's, it's about 20 to 30 people per what's called a shard, that are in are in um, are in a virtual venue, and then it's like the world's biggest IMAX theater. And the front 180 is what we're broadcasting. The back 180 is rendered in the headset as the experience. And there were all these avatars in there. And then something happened that I didn't expect. The lights went down, and I felt a little bit of that same thing that you feel when you're at a live gig, and the lights go down. Even even the 8-bit avatars, Meta has actually done a very good job of encoding just enough emotion in those avatars that you can read people, that you can read excitement, that you can read emotion. And you can hear everybody talking, and then the lights went down, and everybody got quiet, and there was a little bit of that same feeling. And when, and when um, the first show we did with Meta was Vance Joy at Red Rocks a long time ago. And when, and when Vance Joy came up, people started cheering and there, everybody ran to the front of the virtual stage. And it was a little bit of that same experience. And I did not expect that. I was like, well, holy shit. I was like, this is, this is cool. And then, and then it, just, it just built from there. The bigger the shows we did and the more stuff we did. Because if you think about it, if you have a VR headset and you are going to a specific app at a specific time to see a specific artist, you're the definition of a super fan. Um, so, so everybody in there was there for the same reason to see the same thing. And it was a little bit electric. And then we've done shows with Billie Eilish, um, Post Malone, um, some big artists and same thing. 
we did a show with the Foo Fighters that actually um, broke uh, venues. There were enough people going into the headset at once that it actually crashed the platform. So what was supposed to be a wonderful night for me of sort of celebration, because it was a hard gig, was supposed to be a wonderful night of celebration was instead Foo Fighters management texting me with very unfriendly things. And um, because because the platform was down, right? And their artist was looking bad. I got it, but it was, it was unfriendly. They said mean words. So anyway... Well. But, and I think that's that's something that's, well, it, again, it's come out over the last couple of days. You know, we chose the title Staying Human in a Digital World specifically for these reasons. And actually, the the talk I was having with X and Emily this morning, uh, the, the, the need to allow people to have conversation and create these little micro communities and communities where they're actually engaging. And I think that's what frustrates me over the years about some of the creative use of technology by people that I personally don't think get it because like you know they're and, and actually yeah the social media channels have picked up on it and we, I think we talked about it like the NFL is yes it's being televised but oh my god the conversations that are happening on channels like X is where it's really interesting because these these and i think that's what the a lot of the promoters don't understand is you know i had some you know they and don't get me wrong you know the gig is the most important thing but their fans and this is why you know we had a great time with virgin for 17 years activating the headline sponsorship of v because we made sure we looked after the audience yeah, the promoters did the gig, but we made sure all of those people connected, had a good time, and and understood the sociability of the brand, I suppose, is kind of key. So let's kind of uh, use the last section to kind of get into the actual product and the tech, because... You know, and you gave us a little overview in your um, in you know in the introduction, but talk us into a little bit more detail about Arc, Arc Runner. Oh, sure. Um, That's why we're here. I was like, what product? Oh, my product, right. <laughs> The um, so Arc Runner A R K R U N R on YouTube and all the socials. Please like, su subscribe, and whatever the third thing is that people say. Um, and uh, the Arc Runner is something that we build a volume. We build a we build a three D world, and you can pick a three D world, and then you can put yourself into that three D world as either a video layer. Um, or a volume. We support both um, the Microsoft open source format, which was Metastage is the company that people associate with it, or Volograms. And then we also, and then you can set up lights and virtual cameras and then live stream. And we're building it for the future because everything that we have shared, that we all have shared with our, with our phones and our gizmos, everything that we've done for the past hundred years is a 2D slice of a 3D world. We are all we are all taking flat pictures. Sometimes it's stereoscopic and left eye, right eye with some depth, but we are all taking flat pictures and flat video representations to share into the world. That time is coming to an end. We are now just be able being able to start sharing volumes and sharing 3D experiences. I'm sure if you're here, you probably have heard the phrase if, um, nerfs and Gaussian splat and some other things like that. There are fast technologies that allow you to capture volumes and be able to share those volumes. And then the next step after that is being able to step into those volumes and being able to interact in those volumes. And that is the world that we're moving to. And it's, and it's coming, I think, a lot quicker than, than people realize. And again, looking at the next generation of, of media consumers, why would you share a flat 2D image if you can share a 3D volume and interact in that volume? It's like for us, uh, for everybody in this room, why would you share a black and white image when you can share a color image? Why would you share a small a thumbnail when you can share a 4K image? Immersion matters. And, the, and, and kids and people are going to be able to do that. And, it's, and it goes way beyond performance. I mean, one of the things that, that we're doing with ArcRunner in, with the company is that in, in what I call LPW, Lucas's Perfect World, um, in LPW, we want to be the live nation of the, immersive sp of the immersive world. What that means is that we're actually, um, we're actually reaching out to places and we're buying licenses for virtual representations of spaces that no longer exist. Studio 54, 
CBGBs, places like that, the, that every single town, every single town in the world has a place that everybody thinks, oh, remember that place way back when, when we went and saw shows. There, is, there are millions of those, and that not only exists for performance, it exists for historical context, right? Think of, think of things like the civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s in the, in the United States. Uh, things like the Woolworth Lunch Counter, 16th Street Baptist Church, which still exists, but the Woolworth Lunch Counter, 16th Street Baptist Church, um, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, thing which still exists also. But there are spaces and there are moments in time that can be used to recreate and to educate and to give people that emotional connection. Emotional connection is not just about, about performance, it's also about social impact. And it's about how do you do that and how do you give people a message and communicate to them something that matters. So I think it's a, it's a big, exciting world out there. It is. And the, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of great reference points to your last point because um, I've now forgot. Oh, Notre Dame. When Notre Dame burnt down, there were no records um, of its architecture. But, and I can't remember the game, it was 4D shot right. for a video game. That's right. And so they right. used those plans to be able to rebuild it. Like, that's kind of crazy. And, and I think that's what, and then, you know, and this is where, again, technology gets really exciting because, you know, the, and it's been, uh, the, I can't remember the, um, well, the example is during the Ukraine war, the, a lot of their national monuments were getting bombed. And so they were, uh, a company created, a, I think, a 4D imaging app and encouraged people to, I think it started as, uh, as some sort of like, you know, capturing a family experience or stuff, but people then actually started to use it to capture things before well, they got b um, bombed. You know, a good example is um, I, was, I was fortunate enough to be invited to, I did the, a, VR, a VR shoot of Michelle Obama in the White House when she was still first lady. Um, and, and she is a formidable human being. Um, the, and when we did that, it was just an interview with Michelle Obama, the editor-in-chief of The Verge, and Michelle Obama's and the First Lady's communications director. And I had people asking me a lot, well, why would you do a VR? It's just an interview. It's just people sitting there talking to each other. Why does that need to be in VR? And it's pretty simple. It's because when, when we post-produced it and when we released the video, we could have released a very nice video, 16 by 9 HD, 4K video, that would have lived on your screen. And you would have seen your screen, but everything around that screen would have still been your living room, your, your office, whatever it is, right? And when you put on a VR headset, even though it's only an interview, it's the difference between looking at the White House and being in the White House. And that makes a difference. Um, and the, and when you put on, even though it was just an interview, the fact that it's such a historic place and the fact that it's the first lady, um, at a, at a moment in time when she is the first lady. And that's something that people can, that's something that will exist on and something that people can grab hold of in the future. I'll, I'll never forget when we, when I worked for, um, James Cameron, we were asked to do what ended up being Steve Jobs' last Macworld keynote. Um, and shoot that in, stereos in a stereoscopic video format. And it didn't happen for reasons. Um, but I remember thinking, what a shame, because uh, VR wasn't around then, but I still had the thought at that point that immersion matters. I've said it like 19 times now. The, and at that time, high-resolution stereosc stereoscopic capture was the closest to reality that we could get was the closest to reproducing something that lived in real life that we could get. And Steve Jobs died shortly thereafter. And I thought, what a shame, because we could have had that photographic record in a format that would allow us to get as close to the man as, as possible, right? And, and now I think that, that we're at that moment again. Um, several years ago, a uh, guy named a friend of mine, a guy named Paul Debevic, De who's pretty famous in the industry. Paul uh, brought a, a capture rig and scanned um, Barack Obama when he was in the White House and did a full volumetric scan of Barack Obama. And I thought that's the right thing. That's important, right? Because being able to capture people like that in places like that and being able to recreate them as accurately as possible matters for generations to come and, and for the world in general. So I think that the work that anybody that's in this space is doing is it's not just about geekiness and it's not just about creating connection, but it's about historical resonance as well. And it's about capturing moments in time and people and places 
that matter and that will matter to generations to come and being able to communicate to that to them in a way that will make an impact. That's a really good point. And I think that, that it's, it's given digital identity is so important now and also legacy, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons we just do such simple things with all our events. You know, we film it and capture it because there are great conversations like this that people will want to reference and review and go back to and stuff like that. It's for me, and I want to, yes, yeah, interesting given we've just been talking about all this exciting stuff and we're going to end, I think, talking about conferences. Um, but, um, but that's, and I can go for another hour. I mean, yeah, come yeah, on, let's okay. Go. All right. Well, yeah, we'll just go through lunch. But the, the bit for me is the, let's talk about the conferences side in the fact that I've been, we've been approached before to create metaverse conferences and i've been kind of my strategic advice to some of our clients depending on who they are i've been your audience isn't ready for it yet and i don't think your cmo is probably ready to be seen as like a digital avatar walking around you know pressing nft screens or whatever it, again it goes back to this when and where do you introduce gamification but your product is going to change that, isn't it? You've you've got I, an interesting view on kind of conferences. I, I hope so. I hope so. And the and one thing that is putting on my business hat for a minute. One thing that ArcRunner is not is a distribution platform. We are a creation platform. We can create volumes and we can create really good looking performances and really good looking presentations and allow you to put yourself in them. But when you get to distribution, all of a sudden now you're competing with YouTube, Twitch, Facebook companies that have slightly more resources and slightly bigger head start. I think that one thing, and I don't have a crystal ball, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but one thing that needs to happen is, unfortunately, a lot of people that are creating metaverses and creating these sometimes wonderful um, digital landscapes are, they're creating isolated islands and trying to convince everybody to come to their island. And you have to, you have to give people a compelling reason to. We deal, we deal, you know, we deal with uh, musicians a lot that have followings of millions on the various social media platforms that they that they and their teams have worked for years and worked hard to build that audience of millions. And you know, I've seen I don't know how many presentations to where people are like, well, I've built this incredible platform and it does this and it does this and it does this. And it's like, yes, that's wonderful. Why should I bring my audience of millions to your platform and have to recreate that? What are you what are you doing for me? You know, you have to create a trans in the in business, you absolutely have to create a transition plan. There's no such thing as flicking a switch and all of a sudden it's like everything before is bad and now we have to do all this stuff and it's good. It doesn't work that way. You have to create a transition plan for how you're going to move people into this new world. That's why when we do concerts, when we work with musicians, Arc Runner, the Arc Runner and and any other work that we do delivers to YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, Snapchat, Instagram, all the things that where the fans are, and we say, oh, but if you want the really cool experience, that's where you go, right? VR immersive experiences, metaverse experiences are not a separate thing. They're at the end of a delivery chain. There's, you know, nobody uses NTSC and PAL anymore, but there's NTSC, PAL, HD, 2K, 4K, theatrical, monoscopic, stereoscopic, and then at the end of that chain, is immersive because as much as I love it, it is still a niche. It is still a niche medium. There are 20 million Quest headsets out there, which is a lot until you start thinking about how many TV screens there are out there and how many mobile devices are out there. And also, this is the form factor that that will change things. Not a v, not a headset. Not the Apple Vision Pro. Yes, the AVP is cool, but I don't like wearing headsets. Period. And I'm in this world, right? And my mom, for instance, loves headsets. Loves when I show her stuff. Come on, I want everybody in here to think for a minute about trying to walk their mother through putting on a VR headset and setting it up and them using it regularly, right? Just the, the, the thought of horror in all the in everybody in here who is the de facto tech lead for their families, right? Um, the my mom asked me a couple of years ago, should I worry about this blockchain stuff? I was like, oh Jesus, no. Mm -mm. Nope, 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 nope. If anybody says crypto to you, you hit them on the head with a hammer and run away. Right, and she's like, "Okay, I don't need to pay attention to it." I was like, "You do not." Mm -mm. So the and the thing is, is that uh, is that I had a thought, and I forgot where I was going with it. Um, I'll stop in a minute. I promise. Okay. The uh, the 
the this right glasses. If you look at you know, I think where Meta is going, the most important product that I think Meta has right now is the Ray Ban glasses. Um, they, they, and they're generation two of the Ray-Ban glasses because that is one of the first products that you can wear that actually has a virtual presence and experience that doesn't make w people want to punch you in the face, right? Remember Google Glass, when Google Glass came out, the first time I heard the phrase glass hole, I thought, okay, that's over. Um, you know, all the videos of people wearing AVPs out on the street, you just want to hit them. You're like, stop it. That's just silly, right? And these are what changes things, and we're very close. Because if you think about the Ray-Bans, they have a lot of technology in them, they have microphones, they have speakers, they have, react, they have the ability to communicate um, with the phone, and, and, they're wear, and they're wearable devices. Go look at Brilliant Labs, company in Singapore, Brilliant Labs, and the Frame device from Brilliant Labs, which I have put in a pre-order for a few of them. Um, that is an AR, a live AR wearable frame. That is good, that will be something that you can wear, and it, they exist now. They're just in beta. It's something you can wear. You can look at something and say, "Oh, um, uh, tell me about that plant. What I need to do to take care of that plant?" And it has a pinhole camera in it that's not meant to share a picture. It's meant to capture an image, send it to Perplexity AI, which they have a partnership with. Send it to Perplexity. Perplexity analyzes the image, analyzes what you asked, and then feeds it back to the glasses. And then the glasses overlay that in AR, overlay that as an AR overlay on top of the plant, right? And that that's a cool thing. That matters. And the only thing that's missing in the ability to the lenses exist. Because an Oculus Quest, the lenses in a Quest are about this size. The only reason it has all the GAC around it is because the processing technology and the chip technology is not small enough and has a small enough power draw to be able to fit in the stems of glasses. But, you know, I'm not a chip person, but I, I try to read tea leaves. I think that Qualcomm, who's the company that makes most of the mobile chips in the world, I think that Qualcomm is probably a generation or two away from having chips that are small enough with a small enough power consumption that you can fit actual compute in the stems of glasses. And when you can do that, then you put the lenses here and then you have a true game changer in the world. As soon as I can put these on and have a live high resolution overlay, then our world, com all of our worlds completely changes. And, and I also think it's helpful in that context to forget about the distinction between people talk about VR and AR and MR and XR. There is no difference. VR and AR are the same thing. If you think about um, VR is just AR with 100% occlusion. VR is just AR where everything in your field of vision is you're not letting any reality in. You're just completely covering it. And then you start pulling away the mask a little bit, and that's what people think of as AR. And then you add in depth sensing, and that's what people think of as MR and XR. So, and I think we're about, my guess is we're about two to two and a half years away from having these. And as soon as we have those, then everybody here who's wearing sunglasses or glasses, you're gonna have a completely different experience, and that is something people will buy. And that is something people will wear because then you can also accessorize it and you can make it fashionable, which is what matters to young people, right? My, my daughter, I knew that VR was going to succeed when I, I have my own personal focus group, which is my mom, my wife, and my daughters, right? Three generations of people who do not care about technology. And technology is a tool for them. It's not an end. It's not something they enjoy in and of itself, right? And my daughter, who was 16 at the time, and as, as we all know, 16-year-old girls are not at all concerned with how they look and how people see them. Um, so my daughter, I would show her VR things, and she would think that was cool, but oh, she was not going to wear one. Are you kidding me? Until we did a show with Post Malone. And then she said, hey, Dad, can I have a VR headset so I can see the Post Malone show? And I was like, yes! I was like, I win! That's, but in, in, in context, that was a 16-year-old girl asking for a gizmo to put on her head so she could watch content that she cared about. And, and I thought, okay, this, this is going to win. I don't know when and how exactly, but it's going to win. And to be honest, so that's, um, that's so interesting because I do exactly the same with my wife and my two kids. I've got a boy and a girl, twins, age 12. And what was really, what just shows how the worlds they're growing up in. I was saying I'm coming to South by Southwest to do this event. And, you know, they just started yawning, like, oh, it's going to be a conference and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, but, you know, I've got Activision. And they were like, oh, okay. And then when I mentioned Dell and NVIDIA, uh, my 
son just was like, oh my yeah. God, how cool. Like, you know, and, you know, and I know when he watched this content and he'll see the curved screen and the things like that, he'll be like, did he get one for me or stuff like that? And it, but it just shows like it's the, like, you know, he, he, uh, he went to, he did something at school and was like, oh, do you, um, do you think I'm a geek dad? And I'm like, th that's cool now. Geeks are cool now. Co geeks and are I mean, cool. <laughs> we have we do all our production on Dell AMD systems, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Because that combination is what allows us to do all this cool stuff, yeah. right? So Dell, Dell, AMD, um, Nvidia, all the all these companies creating all this stuff. The the fusion between all this tech and creative is, you know, is very direct. My my youngest my youngest knows what an RTX is and oh. knows what a Radeon is, right? And I'm and I'm like, who? What? <laughs> well, but that, but that, and you. Uh, I think the point I want to finish on because we we've got to wrap up unless anybody's got some questions because it's our event so we can overrun as much as we like. <laughs> um, but um, I'll stop talking. I promise. But um, the uh, and we're carrying on through lunch. By the way, this is you know everybody network have yeah. a go on the demos and stuff like that. I so smell, I smell a good. Th is that a taco truck? Yeah, 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 we're doing food. I live. We're doing food. I moved from LA to Canada three years ago. And I, I, I dearly love where I live in Canada, but tacos are something that, that I used to have, right? I lived in L.A. for 20 years. The Canadian version of taco is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not good. But, it, uh, no, to, it, but it's just this whole thing that the, the tech is cool now. And you, the point I wanted to finish on, which uh, we got into when we, we first connected, was this whole, the biggest challenge we've got, particularly in the world of brand marketing and marketing full stop is most of the senior execs are Gen X, you know, and the, yeah. And, but we're creating things for the younger generation. And what we thought was cool has totally changed. And that's what, for me, is so exciting about technology. Again, going back to the point, the critics, you know, I've been in this industry for 20 plus years doing live events. Everything's I've sold out and I've gone into tech and digital and live streaming. I'm like, no, I'm just embracing technology to keep that human connection and also to improve creativity. And that's kind of what's, what's making these brands cool, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. And I think that um, one thing that's important for marketers and advertisers to realize as well is that we've done a lot of studies on our, on our experiences and call to actions, click through rates and engagement on immersed, on immersed experiences are exponentially higher than on, than on laptop and on 16 by 9 experiences. Exponentially higher. It makes sense. Again, immersion matters. How many times have I said it? When, when somebody is surrounded with something, then it's more likely to make an impact on them. And VR is an advertiser's dream come true because you have 100% view and 100% completion. People can't look at anything else. They are looking at what you are showing them and they have to look at it. They literally can't look at anything else. So for advertisers, I, I kind of don't understand why advertisers haven't jumped in more into the immersive space. Obviously, audience numbers are an issue. But as far as com as far as the effectiveness of it, it's incredible. I, I I almost want to disagree with that though because I think I think the techno yeah you know, the the panel we just had earlier that there's so much technology now at our uh, at our you know it's there ready to use. I think the challenge we have on the tech side is and you you've been saying it all along ever since we've been talking you know i'm not a marketeer I'm a marketeer it's our jobs as marketeers to try and turn it into normal language you know my, my brother works for a big microchip company and well i probably shouldn't say this um uh, but he his biggest challenge is these companies are everybody's an engineer and so everybody within the company knows what they're talking about. And actually, we, we do a lot of work with Ericsson. And what we just try and do is turn it into a really easy human language, like spatial computing. You know, spatial computing is brilliant, but to the normal person, what the, but, you know, what does that mean? And, and actually, all we're talking about, and the gentleman earlier, like being able to just now move from 2D, 2D into 3D is a life-changing moment for everybody. 
and and also there is there's one big thing that we haven't talked about it that your previous uh, that the previous panel spoke about is that this immersive world there is the presentation layer which which we focus on but there's also the interactivity layer the avatar representation layer and the interaction layer which is what separates which is what separates this medium in some ways from anything else excuse me is that is the ability to have an embodiment of your physical being in a space and interact with people while you're watching something that technology is brand new and i think ready player me and companies that are doing really good um long-term avatar representation if they have a way to invest in them i i would i would do it well and, and that's uh, the uh, and that's what all the brands were talking about yesterday morning is we went from uh, you know they started talking about this term of emotional marketing and I think that's the key. And it's, again, something we talked about with X in the fact that it's that conversation, it's that emotion, and I could carry on all day. So I um, Yeah, we've gone, I just we, noticed we've gone way yeah, over. we've gone way over. Sorry, any, any, somebody should have stopped us. I'll be here for a couple of minutes, but does anybody have any, any questions? Bueller? Bueller? Oh, yes? So just for the sake of our audience, because you didn't have a mo mic, it's how do you uh, yeah, yeah, bring to life the emotional storytelling, basically. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. It, is, it is a creative medium, like any other creative medium. And you have to learn and experiment and figure out what works and what doesn't, right? When you move from... Uh, when you move from... Uh, mobile when you move from creating a film to creating a game when you move from creating a game to creating something immersive they're just different creative disciplines and i and i recommend you hire somebody or you talk to somebody that has some experience there and you have a message that you want to impart well how do you use this medium to effectively communicate and and impart that message does that answer your question So the that qu question was about how do you, sorry, it's just so for the, for the content and stuff. Oh, we? Okay, great. Uh, well, go on then. You do it. <laughs> she, she said, um, uh, the, when I talked about buying um, licenses for virtual representations of places, where do you buy those licenses from? It's a really good question. Um, the, we have all the musicians that we've worked with, regardless of what company we work with, we do, we've done all the rights work. So I have, I have a, fairly extensive knowledge in my head of how to license and how to do music rights for for uncharted spaces, right? I'm arguably one of the most experienced people in the world for licensing music for VR, you know, for the very tiny niche window of people that need that. I'm your guy, right? But the, the spaces, it's... Um, it is a question, uh, it's interesting, nobody knows is the short answer. I just figure it out because it really comes down to how do you license something that no longer exists, right? And it usually comes down to, it. sometimes it, you can just do it. Sometimes you can just do it. The only times you have to license, the only times you really have to license something is if somebody still owns the trademark or the logo that goes along with it, right? Because nobody owns the space, but there's still IP sometimes associated with that space. Who owns that IP and do they have rights? Does that IP have rights over naming and over over a representation of that space? Because a lot you've heard the phrase name, image, and likeness, right? Name, image, and likeness also extends to the virtual world, right? Whether it's TV, print, or the virtual world. Does somebody own the name, image, and likeness of that brand? If they do, then you have to deal with them, and it's a fairly straightforward discussion. Once you explain to them what you're trying to do, it's a fairly straightforward discussion because their lawyers go, oh, you just want to license the brand to do a representation of it. It's like doing print, but different. And I'm like, yes. And then they get that. Um, but you sort of have to find, it's a per venue thing. If the space doesn't exist, you have to do a search for the brand, who owns the brand, who owns the name, image, and likeness, if anybody does, and then have a conversation with them. Right, I'm going to call it um, a, a day on that one. Thank you so much, Lucas. Thanks, Thank everyone. you, Dell. Thank you, NVIDIA. Um, Please stick around for something to eat. I just seen somebody's come out with a Bloody Mary. They are very good. Um, perfect hangover cure and good start to a Monday afternoon. Um, and also, please, there'll be this demo. It's very, very cool. I recommend you have it a go, give it a go and ask any questions. Thank you so much for coming. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>